Okay, I got my sign. Recording in progress. Let's welcome everybody to today's continuation of a very interesting series of talks related to oceanography. It's a great pleasure today to introduce our speaker, Eric Hochberg from the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, who will talk to us about coral reef ecology through optics and you already coming into the room gives you a sense of how beautiful all that is and I'm looking forward to seeing more of that in the talk. Eric is a senior scientist at the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences. He is a reef systems ecologist. I'm, I'm learning more and more backgrounds of, of people and his main research uh, centers on interaction between light and the function of tropical and subtropical shallow water ecosystems, mainly coral reefs. Eric's current research projects include a NASA-funded Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory with the acronym CORAL, very, very nicely done. <laughs> and uh, it's a, a three-year mission that uses airborne instrumentation and remote sensing approaches to identify reef composition and model primary production from an ecosystem perspective. Eric received his PhD in oceanography from the University of Hawaii in 2002, where he studied spectral reflectance and remote sensing of coral reefs, so already an entrance into work that he continues uh, today. Prior to joining the Bermuda Institute of Ocean Sciences, Eric was an assistant professor at the NOVA Southeastern University Oceanographic Center. Currently, he serves as the associate editor for the journal Frontiers in Marine Science, Coral Reef, which is one of the editions of, the, of this journal. He's also on the editorial board of the Remote Sensing of Environment Journal. Of the NASA. Oh, Spurry mission, probably butchered that, that acronym uh, study, and he's serving on the ecosystems panel for the decadal survey for earth science and applications from the space by the National Academics Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. With that, please uh, let me invite Eric to join us here at the podium and deliver his talk. Thank you very much, Peter. Hello, everybody. Um, hopefully this makes sense. I hope. And uh, I hope that uh, there are lots of pretty pictures. I don't know if they're all going to be like this, but uh, we'll see. So first, coral reefs. So the beginning of this talk is coral reefs 101 is what I call it. Uh, why are they important? Why do we care? Why do you care in Arizona about coral reefs? So this is a question when you write a proposal to NASA um, that, uh, or, or NSF, you have to explain the value. Well, there are several reasons why we care. Uh, first off, coral reefs are a locus for traditional culture. Um, we get some novel medicines from coral reefs. There's a wonderful painkiller that comes from a cone snail um, that's uh, more, more potent than morphine and it's non-habit forming. Unfortunately, it has to be injected into your spine Got to work on something. Fishing uh, uh, harbors for, for shipping, uh, other biotechnology can come, not just medicines. Uh, traditional fishing, traditional subsistence, important stuff. Um, barriers uh, for, for shoreline protection, of course, multi billion dollar tourism industry. And, and then just biodiversity, just as biodiversity is important. So reefs are important. Um, here's the the Reef Ecology 101, there is no good universally accepted definition of what a reef actually is. Uh, this is the one that I like, and uh, now I can't read it all, but that's okay. Um, reefs are tropical and subtropical marine ecosystems that contain one or more uh, communities dominated by corals and other framework building organisms, not just corals, other things build reefs. Um, such as crustose coralline algae. These communities have persisted uh, or recurred 
because they'll die and grow back over a long enough period to build a structure on top of pre-existing structure. Reefs have to grow on pre-existing structure. This is the barrier reef of Kaneohe Bay, Hawaii, Oahu, Hawaii. It's growing on a lithified sand dune. So that's how reefs grow. And this is just a, a nice complicated graph that I'm not gonna go into detail, just shows you this is a cross section of another reef in, in Hawaii, showing you that this is the, 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 the volcanic rock and the reef is growing on top of it. And these colors here show you that different things are building the reef. The yellow is coral, red is coralline algae. So different things build the reef and they have to grow on these. So that's introduction to how reefs sort of exist. Reefs are mosaics of different types of communities. They're not all corals. And I, have, I wanna emphasize that they get convolved, they get convoluted, uh, whatever the term is. People think corals are reefs. It's not true. Cor reefs are ecosystems. Corals live there. This happens to be a very pretty high uh, area of a lot of coral on a reef. This area has a little bit less coral, more algae on it. This area has even less coral and more algae on it. And this is virtually all algae. This is all coral reef, what we call a coral reef. They all coexist. And this is an example of how they might coexist. This is Palau in the Western Pacific. It's east of the Philippines. Uh, you see a barrier reef ringing the island here. Uh, and we zoom in on the barrier reef and you can see the different colors uh, are, are patches of different types of communities. The bright blue is sand, kind of boring, but then there's some algae growing on. Coral tends to grow along the front and then on patches out here in the lagoon. It's very patchy in the communities together. It's a mosaic. That's how reefs are organized. Um, reefs have very high, very high rates of primary production, very high. I'll, I'll get into this a little bit more because this is really what I'm ultimately interested in. Um, but these are, these are high rates of primary production on this, this is Kaneohe Bay again, um, from, from, from space. Um, and they also have high rates of calcification. So calcification is the process that the organisms are building limestone building the bricks that make the reef. That's calcification. It happens in the algae and in the corals. Um, calcification turns out to actually be correlated to primary production, to photosynthesis. So more photosynthesis, you get more calcification. So they're related. And then there's a, a little bit of that later on. Different communities, different organisms have different rates, corals, a very high productivity and calcification. Uh, macroalgae, the fleshy stuff, the seaweeds have high production, production but low calcification or none. And coralline algae will have relatively low production and calcification, but they still do it. So remember, reefs are mosaics, they're patchworks of all these different things, and they're all going at different rates. So that's this is how reefs are built. This is an example, and we talk at all. Uh, in the Marshall Islands, northern hemisphere, sort of southwest of Hawaii, quite a ways, out in the blue water, in the, in the deep ocean, this is the rate of primary production, less than a gram of carbon per meter squared per day. Not a lot. It's pretty low. The reef will be 10 to 20 grams per meter squared per day, 25 times that or more. And of course, there's not a lot of calcification out here at all, if any and the reef is building about four to eight kilograms per meter squared per year. So that's how the reef grows and maintains itself near sea level. And one of the questions, um, well, one of the questions is, is how? Because the nutrient concentrations out here in the ocean are very, very low, often below detection limit. So the nutrients are the fertilizer for the plants that do the photosynthesis, if there's no fertilizer, the plants don't grow, which is why the phytoplankton have such low productivity. So what's the deal with the reef? How, how is that possible? And this was a fundamental problem that people were trying to solve for a long time. We're getting to where I come in a little bit, a little bit. Um, it was it's observed, this is another cross section of a reef. Here's an island here. This is the fringing reef that abuts the island. And then there's sort of the rim of that fringing reef. This is the deep lagoon, a little patch reef in there, another lagoon. This is the barrier reef and the slope that goes out to the ocean. 
where all the growth is, the productivity and the calcification is on the edges of all these things. High activity areas where there's a lot of water flow. And this thing here on the right has got probably the worst axis label I've ever seen in my life. Won't belabor it. This axis is the rate of transfer of materials between the water and the benthos. So it's either into the benthos or out from the benthos, but it's the rate. How fast does that happen? That is very strongly correlated to this mess. This mess is how fast the water's flowing, the U, the friction of the bottom, the Reynolds number, which talks about how turbulent the flow is, and the Schmidt number, which talks about, so this is this depends on the, on the material, is nitrate or phosphate or whatever, um, the, the relative uh, diffusion versus advection, right? So it's a mess down here. And, and my advisor, my garage advisor I walked into, he's the one that work, was working this out. And this is a good friend of mine, Jim Falter, uh, made this graph in black and white and Steve Monismith made it color. So, but, but the transfer of material depends on water flow, which is why you have high, high growth where the materials can transfer in. So it's about water flow. So when I showed up in Hawaii in the mid nineties, my advisor, Marlon Atkinson was trying to make a model of the Ganeo Bay Barrier Reef that would take into account water flow, nutrient uptake, and then predict growth and things like that. And here's the, how the water tends to flow across the reef. Um, but uh, it wasn't working. The hydrodynamic model wasn't working. Oops, I thought there was more here. There's not. You can see there's different bottom types. It's patchiness on reefs. Friction of the, of the, of the bottom varies with the bottom type. So sand is smooth, less friction. Corals are rough, there's more friction. And that affects how fast the water flows in different areas. And they were just using a single friction factor for the whole thing. That's why the hydrodynamics didn't work. I came in, said, well, can we put numbers, relative numbers on the different areas of the reef? So here we go. This is topographically rough, higher friction, smooth, lower friction, right? It turns out these areas are generally higher productivity and calcification. These are lower productivity and calcification because the communities, the different kinds of communities, right? They correlate. And of course, in the late 90s, with the global glass bleaching event, people started really, really worrying about this being healthy and this being not healthy. Because this is a lot of coral, this is all dead coral. And the concern, of course, was and is to this day, these communities turning into these communities. This is the conservation issue, right? So, and of course I put healthy in quotes because I don't really know what a healthy reef is, but that's a, that's a philosophical debate we can have. Um, what is causing these shifts? Well, people mostly, right? It's always people. Coastal development, ocean warming, oh, sewage. This is fun. This is a sewage uh, diffuser, except I like to point this out. There's corals growing all over the sewage diffuser. So that's funny. Um, of course, you know, the natural things like crown of thorns, starfish, and storms. Um, there's more diseases seem to be becoming more prevalent these days. This is black band disease on this coral here. You can see the black band. Uh, ocean acidification and um, overfishing and destructive fishing pr practices. All of these things together impact reefs. So if areas with, 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 you know, that we like that are pretty are healthy and the other areas are not, it turns out that the universal metric for reef health is how much coral is there. Coral cover, it's called. So how much coral is there? These are all just, this is nine examples of papers to talk about if you, I know it's an eye chart, you can't really see, but there's, there's a coral cover, coral cover, coral cover, on the, on the, on the, on the y-axis, coral cover, cover, coral cover in, in, in colors. It's all how much coral is there, how much coral has it changed. People measure other things. They go, how many fish and, 
and what's the diversity? And there's lots of lots of metrics, but across the board, everywhere you go, from Florida, Australia, Hawaii, Tahiti, how much coral is there? It's the universal metric. How do you measure coral? Well, you put on a scuba tank and get in the water, right? That's what we do. We put on sunscreen first. Lots of laborious approaches, like writing down what's in every little square of this quadrat. That's fun. Or you can take a photograph of the quadrat and analyze it back in the lab. You can do a, a, a what do they call it, a belt transect, where you zoom along with the, and then look on either side of the tape. You can do a line transect, a line point intercept transect, a video transect. You can take the time and, and measure the sizes and dimensions of corals. You can be shark bait. This is called a manta tow. You get towed by a boat for a certain amount of time. And you say, oh, there was this much coral. There's 20% coral. And you write it down. And, get... and nowadays, a lot of people are doing uh, photo mosaics where you take a couple hundred photos and stitch them together. This is about 10 meters across here. And it's about 500 photos all stitched together. So you can do that. The common thing among all of these is scuba tank, scuba tank, scuba tank, scuba tank, scuba tank, scuba tank. And when you're diving on a reef, you can see about from where I stand to the back wall. And you can swim not much farther in an hour. So what you end up with is not a big sample area. This is me in better days um, doing a transect on a reef in Hawaii. I mapped out this reef about 0.01 square kilometers. Just in the water was 32 hours just in the water. That's not boating time and travel time and all that stuff. Here is the part of the rim of Chuk Atoll in uh, uh, Micronesia. It's about a square kilometer. Here's Rangaroa Atoll. The rim is 150 square kilometers and uh, the rim and the lagoon, there's stuff in the lagoon, is 1,500 square kilometers. So scale up the effort to try to get detailed maps of this diving bring a lot of sunscreen and a lot of friends. It's gonna take a while, right? Oh, right, reef global ecosystem. This is a nice map of, of where the reefs are. And this is showing you a histogram by longitude, histogram by latitude. Well, there's about 9,000 systems in the world, about 500,000 square kilometers of reef. Not a lot of area. That's why reefs don't contribute to global biogeochemical cycles because they have cover a very small footprint. But they're spread over 200 million square kilometers of ocean. So you can't really just like hop in and look here and there. If you're generous and you add up all the quantitative surveys that have been done on reefs, you'll probably end up with that hundreds of square kilometers have been surveyed direct quantitatively, if you're generous which comes out to about 0.1% of the world's reef area. So the issue that I have, unpopular issue that I have, is that is that really representative of the world's reefs? We're talking about the demise of this ecosystem. This is a big deal. It's an important ecosystem. Are these are the numbers from that enough? Well, you can't do it diving. So I come in, let's do remote sensing because that's a bird's eye view. You get a big picture, right? Well, remote sensing isn't so easy. People were doing it on land for years and the open ocean for years. This is basically land under a lens of water, which makes it harder. But you have these issues of here's your satellite, looks like a pair of pants with a rainbow coming out of it, but it's a satellite. Looking down, the atmosphere gets in the way. Light scattered, light reflects off the ocean surface. That gets in the way. Light scatters in the water, that gets in the way. And then you have reflection of sunlight off the reef surface. Well, only that can tell you about the reef. Everything else is in the way. So the issue is you've got to do atmospheric correction, glint correction, and water column correction successfully to get this. And, and when I showed up, no, it didn't exist. So Looking at that one thing at the, at the reef surface, if you can't do it without the water, without the atmosphere, then you won't be able to do it with the water and atmosphere. So my master's degree was looking at just 
the, the reflection part. And that's what this is. We got data in Hawaii, measured a lot of reflectance spectra. I'll show you, you'll see some of those later. And then did some fun multivariate analysis called discriminant analysis. And what that does is it basically plots the, the data points in the way that best separates them. That's all I'm trying to do here. And so the red dots are your corals, various species. The green dots are your algae, various species. And the yellow dots are your sediment sand. And you can imagine drawing a line straight down there that separates the coral and algae from the sand. You can draw a line right through there and that separates the algae from the coral, right? So at the same time, the, the Naval Research Lab was doing actually some testing of airborne imaging in Hawaii. And I got a hold of some of the imagery. Fantastic. I applied this to it and made this map. This is my 32 hours in the water map. And I don't know if you can see the little black dots. That's every point where I took a sample, right? So you can compare my in the water map to the airborne map, which took about a second to make, 32 hours, one second. And it does very well. So this was very exciting, way, 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 more than 20 years ago. Wow, okay. But this is a shallow reef and there's more, more to work on. Based on those results, my advisor and people in the planetary sciences department at, at Hawaii, like, oh, we need to put a satellite in space. Great, count me in. So we proposed CRESPO, Coral Reef Ecosystem Spectrophotometric Observatory. Also happened to be, um, oh my gosh, 20,000 leagues under the sea, Captain Nemo's Island, as I understand it was named CRESPO. I don't, anyway, tangential. Um, we did a pre-proposal and then they gave us money to develop this concept study. And it was great, it was fantastic. When they gave us the money to do this full concept study, the full proposal, and by the way, this was before turning in PDFs. So we printed a hundred copies of this proposal and it, they were in binders. It was a lot of fun. Um, they said, great, your thing works in Hawaii. How do you know it works everywhere else? Well, we know it does because of physics and biology, but sure, I'll take a world tour. So I got to go to all these wonderful little places, Caribbean, South Pacific, Western Pacific. I didn't get to go to my yacht. I borrowed data from someone who went there. This is my very original spectrometer measuring setup, a 30 meter fiber optic cable with a trigger, goes up to a boat, someone on a laptop getting seasick, operating it. And I'm pointing it at various things underwater. It's evolved a lot since then. But that was great. Here's that map again. Here are spectra on the x-axis of these is wavelength in nanometers. So this is the visible light from 400 is the blue, 500 to 600 is roughly green to yellow, and uh, 600 to 700 roughly orange to red, red mm -hmm. colors. And I did it for all these different things. There's crustose coralline algae, fleshy brown algae, green algae, red algae. <laughs> algal turfs, different kinds of corals, seagrasses and sand and others. And so I built a spectral library of things and so I could do some analyses with them. One of the analyses I did was I simplified all of this into three groups, coral, algae, and sand. And I said, can you tell them apart around the world? This is what NASA wanted to know, right? Um, and if you have these full resolution data where you can see all the wiggles, it does a great job separating three groups. If you use the sensor called Avarice, which is uh, by JPL, and it's less, it's less resolution, it's about, it samples every 10 nanometers, which is still pretty good. It does a really good job separating the groups. When you get into satellites like Landsat, not so good. And the newer satellites worldview, it doesn't look so good, but it actually does decently. It's not great, not as good as not as good as hyperspectral, so-called, but pretty good. So, that going for us. This is all, by the way, still underwater, up close to the bottom, not dealing with the water or the atmosphere. Now, looking at all these data. Oh, by the way, Crespo, I didn't mention was proposed to a program called the University Earth System Science Program, UNES, at NASA. 
And that was, we submitted it in very early 2001. And it was gonna be a camera on the International Space Station. It was very exciting. And then uh, George Bush became president and the UNS program was cut. So they never actually made a selection. We were very long, far along in the selection process, but the program got cut, so we got set back. But here are the spectra from those, those groups again. And one thing that is immediately obvious to me because I've looked at these a lot is you see this feature here in all of the spectra, this little dip, that's chlorophyll. Everything in the water has chlorophyll on it. If you put your shoe in the water, it'll have chlorophyll on it tomorrow or the next day, depending how clean your shoe is, right? But everything's got chlorophyll, pigments. So I thought, hey, what about coral specifically? I took the pigments that are in corals, chlorophyll A, chlorophyll C2, pyridinidine, dinoxanthin, beta carotene, and mixed them in the proper amounts and made up an absorption spectrum of coral. That's that thick blue line there. That's the absorption spectrum. I made it up. Turned it upside down and compared it to my average coral spectrum here. So the blue line is what I made up. The red line is what I measured. And they match pretty well. Not perfectly, but pretty well. They have, they have bumps in all the right places and dips in the right places. So it tells me that the spectrum I'm measuring for coral, this red line here, is driven by pigments, which means, unsurprisingly, I should be able to go backwards. I should be able to measure the spectrum and get the pigments from that. That's what they do with terrestrial remote sensing and ocean remote sensing. Why can't we do it on reefs? So this is important because. Here's the full reef of Rangaro Atoll. This is, this is monospecific. This is all possible for a varicosa, same species. Which ones are healthy? It's like asking which ones of us are healthy, right? Various stages of unhealth or whatever health means, right? I ask this, I ask this of students. I say, which coral is healthy here? And they go, oh, the purple one. No, the brown one. How do you know? So one way to tell would be to measure the pigments. So this was done with a student back in Hawaii. Um, I measured spectra. Here you go, the spectra um, over a coral. And she took a little piece of the tissue, ran it through high-performance liquid chromatography to actually get the pigment concentrations. And then I built a model between the spectra and the pigment concentrations to get the six main photosynthetic pigments. And uh, this is the actual pigment concentration, and this is the predicted from the optics, and it works pretty well. This is still preliminary. It needs to be expanded, other coral species, other places, but, but the concept is there. I use that with interns in Bermuda, which is, this is exciting because if you don't have to break a piece off the coral to get its pigments, if you can just point a spectrometer at it, then you don't have to kill it and you can make measurements every day. So welcome interns to Bermuda. We can do it every day in the winter, spring and summer. And of course you can measure temperature every day. You can measure how much light is coming down every day. And with the spectra, we can get how much chlorophyll is in the corals every day. And then you can do some fun time series analysis, looking at the cross correlations between them. This is the correlation between chlorophyll and temperature. And if I explain this really quickly for not, if you're not familiar with it, there's this on the X axis is the lag in days. And that is if you plot temperature on one axis and chlorophyll on the other axis, you get the correlation between the, the two variables, right? Get the correlation. What if you plot, what if you shift the temperature by a day and then plot that against chlorophyll and get that correlation? What if you shift the temperature by another day and get that correlation and so on? That's what this is showing. And there's negative lags and positive lags. Positive lag means temperature 
precedes, the change in temperature precedes the change in chlorophyll. Negative lag means the change in chlorophyll precedes the change in temperature, right? The dashed lines are the significance, 5% alpha, you know, the statistical significance. So if, if the correlation is outside the dashed lines, positive or negative, it's statistically significant. That's the explanation. So in temperature, in the winter, when temperature goes up, a week later, chlorophyll goes up. That's what this is saying. In the spring, temperature and chlorophyll are going up together at the same time because the lag is it's all around the lag of zero. In the summer, temperature goes up, chlorophyll goes down a week later. So the relationship is dynamic and it's changing throughout the year. And if you do your bleaching study, which is raising temperatures and, and seeing what the core response is, if you do that in the winter, you're going to get a different answer than if you do it in the summer. These corals weren't bleaching. This is early summer before they were stressed. But something is switching in the corals, telling them, oh, now when temperature goes up, we've got to start losing chlorophyll. I don't know how that turns on. I don't know what the, what the, 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 the triggers, what the genetics, but it's there. The interesting one is the chlorophyll in light. I'm taking a long time on this, I'm sorry. Chlorophyll in the winter, chlorophyll drops two days before light increases. In spring, it's a little bit messy, but a week before light increases, chlorophyll decreases. And then a few days after, chlorophyll will increase again. And then in the summer, it's a very strong pattern. A week before light increases, chlorophyll drops, and a week after, chlorophyll goes up. They're anticipating changes in the light field. And that's really neat. And it's not surprising because corals evolved 300 million years ago. They've been around long enough to evolve these things. This is all observational. I want to work with someone to actually get into how, what's, what triggers are turning on. Anyway. Moving on, more coral spectra, because they're pretty. They look pretty much the same, they, pretty much. There are differences to be sure, um, and wiggles here and there, but they all tend to have follow the same sort of pattern that I showed down here. And it turns out that statistically, you can't use the spectra to identify species of coral. Color is not a good determinant, but, is a possibility. Here are nine species of Acropora in New Caledonia, and they all have slightly different shapes of spectra. So one idea is that the diversity of the spectra might correlate with the diversity of the species, right? I don't know. It's un unknown, unexplored. Shifting gears a lot, just because I'm trying to throw everything in here. Measuring optical properties. And now we're talking about the water, not the corals. Here's an expensive piece of equipment that we got for the hyperspectral imager for the coastal ocean, which is was put on the space station. We were part of the uh, initial work for it with the Naval Research Laboratory. This, this stuff measures the absorption and scattering of light in the water. That's what the water is doing. And this is Hawaii uh, Kaneohe from the spring in 2006. This is one day to the next. And absorption changes from one day to the next. Scattering changes from one day to the next. The water optical properties are changing very rapidly in space and time. That's what I want to get there. Similar stuff in New Caledonia. We did a transect offshore to inshore, uh, about 20 kilometers. You can see this is temperature. And we did profiles, vertical profiles along the way. This area right here is about right here in the, in the transect. And there's something going on where we have higher absorption and lower scattering. Something is going on, something is growing, something is affecting the water optical properties. And it's, it, it don't know what the biogeochemistry is, wide open, unstudied, how the reef biogeochemistry affects the optical properties and what we can infer from the optical properties. I mentioned this before. This is productivity. 
This is light, how much light gets absorbed by the reef. This is for the Conneary Bay Reef. I'm showing lots of pictures of it. Productivity is strongly correlated with how much light. It's photosynthesis. Photosynthesis uses light. There you go, right? This over here shows productivity and calcification. And this is from other data from uh, around the world, compiled uh, in 1985. And there's a pretty good correlation. This I mentioned this calcification to productivity. Stepping back to this one here, this is, I'm stealing this from the terrestrial field. Productivity is how much light gets absorbed, that's what this mess is, times the efficiency. And the efficiency is the slope, right? So this slope times how much light you absorb gives you the productivity. Because calcification is correlated to productivity, you could hypothetically have a similar equation where calcification is a function of how much light gets absorbed and a calcification efficiency by correlation. I'm just mentioning that. I don't revisit that at all. But here's that picture I showed before, Kanye Bay Barrier Reef. This is this productivity map was done based on that relationship I just showed you, how much light gets absorbed times the efficiency. Now, we don't actually know what the efficiency of reef communities are, unknown to, the, to this point. So I made a guess. And I guessed, okay, these numbers match what we measure. I've gone to the good stuff. So I'm talking way too much. This is of minor interest. It's about glint on the sea surface and how you can remove it and see more clearly through the water. Left, right. I'll skip it. This is some other work I did for the US Navy. They wanted to put an aircraft carrier berth here or here. To do that, they wanted to dredge here. And so we surveyed all the reef in this harbor in Guam. And all the dots are the survey sites, how red it is, how much coral there is. If very red, it's coral. If it's white, there's no coral. And this was weeks and weeks of survey and uh, decided we should do some remote sensing. We made a map and this map matches very well. Just showing you the sorts of things, trying to understand how the communities are distributed. And this was actually an ap application because we wanted to dredge this, this thing right here and there's not a lot of coral there. So that had application uh, impl implications. This is the stuff, Coral Reef Airborne Laboratory. We started the proposal in 2020, 2012. We submitted in 2014, a year and a half of intensive proposal development and writing. The issue is the sampling, sampling. We published this, I won't go into detail, but there's not a lot of data points. And this shows you the effort per square kilometer on all these sites, the colors are correlated to how much effort at the sites around the world. And it turns out that if you take available data you can download, don't get trends that you expect. With coral cover, remember that's the metric, and all of these biogeophysical forcings, aragonite saturation state, these are all bleaching trends. This is waves, this is light. This is diversity, human, various human threats. Everywhere I have a red X, it means the trends don't match what we expect. Everywhere I have a green check, the trends do follow what we expect. The numbers are spearman rate correlation coefficients. And they're all significant except this one, statistically. But what does it mean? It's a mess. And that was why we said we need to do coral because this is all done in water. This is all not done from space or airplanes. This is all done diving. And the existing in-water survey data don't follow expected trends. So the conclusion there, either we don't know how reefs work. I don't wanna say that, I, I, I don't think that's true. Or our data are insufficient. That's what the hypothesis for coral was. So we submitted that. Peter mentioned, but that, so that went off to NASA and sat for a while. In the meantime, Peter mentioned I was on the National Academy of Sciences panel for uh, um, decadal strategy, Earth observations from space. 
what's come out of this is surface biology and geology is a NASA mission that is in development right now. This was fun uh, uh, work in Maui. I won't get into it, but there was a lawsuit went all the way to the Supreme Court. I was on the Maui side serving the reef and understanding whether the submarine groundwater discharge from these two sites impacted the reef. And the answer is no. Uh, what impacts the reef is this long beach here and the sand abrasion. Anyway, submitted in January 2014, designated selectable in November 2014, and funded at the threshold level in June 2015. I was the PI. It was a partnership with JPL, of course, NASA funding. Very exciting. Quick mention of the management. This is a mess. Project management, systems engineering, safety engineering, science, uh, instrument, flight systems, operations, science, data systems. It was fun being in charge of all that. Thankfully, I did have a very helpful project manager, but it was fun. It was a big learning experience to be in charge of all of this. 100 people at various times. Um, of course, you work on your schedule and the budget. This is the top level budget, $15 million over four years. The issue, the question was, like I said, the hypothesis, we need to make better observations of reefs. That's with that. And then we need to redo that analysis that I showed you. And we went to Hawaii, Marriott Islands, Palau, Great Barrier Reef, and we got some data in Florida as well. I have a wonderful group of partners, made it all happen. Um, this is for the engineering nerds. The sensor goes in a vacuum chamber. We cut a hole in the bottom of a Gulfstream jet. And as soon as we cut the hole, it became an experimental aircraft. So I couldn't fly in it. I don't have an experimental cert, but they flew it. There's all the sensor specifications. Again, Great Barrier Reef, um, Hawaii, Marianas, Palau, and then Florida, uh, time frame 2016, 2017. We have terabytes and terabytes of data, all publicly available. I can point you to it if you want it. We got about 2% of the world's reef area, is what I estimate. Intensive field validation campaign for atmosphere correction, for water column correction. Remember that cartoon I showed about all the steps you got to do? We were trying to get productivity. And so we validated um, refunction with gradient flux measurements. And of course, benthic cover doing photo mosaics. I'm not going to get into all those. Here's an example product. This is the Torres Strait, Northern Australia, between Australia and New Guinea. This is the flight lines. Here's the map of probability of coral, algae, and sand. We decimate that to one kilometer boxes, and this is what you get in terms of coral cover. The coral data set then looks something like this, where you have coral, algae, and sand cover, and each of the biogeophysical forcings at the same scale regular saturation state, so on and so forth, all for the same boxes. Now we can do statistics, right? So it's for all the places we went, we do this, and we still get unexpected trends. And I underscore provisional and italicize it because I want to make sure that the answer is, is actually accurate before I get it out there. But all these red X's, show that they're not following the expected trends. That's an issue. So it's not scale, that's the issue. However, reefs are complex and these are all X versus Y plots. So maybe it should be a little bit more complicated than that. So multivariate analyses, try to build a more complex model. This is bag ensemble of regression trees for the in-water data, we can explain 38% of the variability of coral cover. For the airborne data from the coral mission, we can explain 64% of the variability. That's an improvement. We still can't explain 36%. So there's more going on about how reefs work. Young coral, here's a nice picture of me. I never even, even pay attention. There I am in the back swinging around the spectrometer. 
gradient flux measuring light and the productivity of the benthos measures oxygen flux and the water flux. Chiara Pisapia was a postdoc for Bob Carpenter, who was at Cal State Northridge. And they, they did this aspect as part of the coral and got productivity for all these sites. Well, Lizard Island, that's a great barrier reef. Hawaii, Guam, for the different kind of communities, sand, algae, coral dominated. And she published this to sort of show that, that what Don Kinsey said back in the 80s, that they have, you know, uh, um, sort of modes of values sort of holds true. But if you remember way back, I said we don't know what the efficiencies of the bottom types are. I don't remember that. I have this data that Kiara put together, and that's on this y axis here. I got the light data, how much light each of those sites was absorbing in a day. And I plot them together, and the colors of these dots correlate to how much of algae or coral or sand is in at that site. So this is high coral, this is all sand, right? The green is all algae. That's, that's what it means. Doing some bootstrap analysis of this, I get some estimates of light use efficiency for coral, algae, and sand, which we can put error bars on. Coral probably has an efficiency around 6%, algae around 5%, and sand around 1.5%. This is very preliminary but also very exciting because this is the first numbers we get for these. What's next? Predicting reef futures. You can't see it, it's cut off. It's wonderful, it says predicting reef futures. That's what we wanna do. We wanna know how reefs are gonna be impacted by global change. This is the coral mission idea right here. That benthic cover, that coral cover is a function of environmental parameters. You have wave height, and, and you relate it, it's, it's static. Coral two, or the new SBG mission I mentioned, or some other data set. Maybe you could make a model like this, where the change in cover, in coral cover over time, is a function of, of course, the environmental parameters, but also the change over time of the environmental parameters. Make a dynamic model. And, that would let us hopefully actually predict reef futures. Something like this. This is Hawaii in 2001. This is Hawaii in 2017. In the ocean, we have um, temperature stress. That's basically what it's telling you. And on land, we have, we have the land cover class of categories of you know, forests and, and shrubs and all that stuff in both of these. And you can see how they're different because things have changed. This is the difference image. This is 2017 minus 2001. You can see where, um, where, 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 where if, it's, if it's positive, that means there's more thermal stress in 2017. If it's negative, it means there's less, right? And on land, it's not a lot of change. Maui gets a lot of change here of to direct human use and from direct human use. It's not, not and Hilo, right? Not a lot of other places get a lot of change. We happen to have imagery from Hawaii in 2000, 2017 from the same sensor flown by NASA in a U2 spy plane, not a spy plane. It's their version of it. We have those data. We need to be processed. It's a wonderful PhD project. Anyway, I said a lot. I gave you a lot. I hope it was interesting. I hope. I didn't blow by stuff too much. Of course, you can ask questions. I'm happy to answer questions. Um, the, you know, the sign is okay. Everything's okay. Thank you very much. I really appreciate just the science communication you're doing. So for someone like me, this would be the first time I'd see anything like this and you did a great job of explaining it. And the desire in me to make order of that chart where it was 0.38 and 0.64 made me wonder, wouldn't it be so convenient if they were just the opposites of each other? Like this is the 0.36 and this is the 0.64. So is it just subsumed in the 0.64 that you can see all that 0.38 variability 
in the one where you can see more, or is there some difference between what you see in one versus the other? Well, that's a good question. There are actually different data sets. Okay. So it's the, the data aren't from the same places. Got so it. there are a lot of caveats in that, but the, the general idea is just that we're improving the predicted ability. Yeah. That's all I'm trying to get across there. That made a lot more sense. Thank you. It made it all made a lot of sense. I just <laughs> definitely first time I hear any of it. You kind of reminded me as a kid. I told my mom I wanted to see every blade of grass on the planet, and I was so upset that I couldn't. And you just kind of made me feel like that when you're trying to see everything that you can. It's really impressive. So thank you for answering all the questions. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great talk. You did really did a lot of pioneered and fundamental work for the coral reef. So I have two questions. The first one, you asked me for the GPP for the coral reef. Mm -hmm. Is that similar you can move into seagrass regions or is there any other different relationship between GPP and seagrass and using the light detector for that? I think so. I haven't done it. Um, there are a lot of people working on seagrasses, but absolutely, why not? Yeah, that's also interesting in the future. And uh, you mentioned about the uh, environmental factors modeling that. So that be will be the both uh, ocean factors like the temperatures and also the land factors, yes. different land conditions, also including the human activity mm -hmm. modeling for that. Yes, like, uh, it should. Yeah. It should all be included because it's all connected. Okay. So if you want to understand how coral reefs don't exist by themselves, they're connected to land, they're connected to the ocean. And so if you want to understand how they're responding to global change, global change is happening not just globally, but also locally. We have to get it all in there if we want to build a useful model. I think you had your hand up. <laughs> yeah. So do you have enough data that you could sort of, if you think predicting the future, uh, whether the dynamic of change stays sort of within a what you can establish as a baseline up, or whether there is a, another derivation of the change of the change. So in other words, would the dynamic change if you reach certain thresholds? I don't know. I mean, that's a great question. I would like to find out. Well, the, we were funded at what we call the threshold level. NASA has the threshold and the baseline. The baseline gives you all the money. The threshold gives you some of the money. So, <laughs> so we got some of the money. And, and we had to scale back, or we were going to, be, it was going to be two or three years of, of flights hitting a lot more places. We were going to Indian Ocean, across the Pacific, into the Caribbean, um, but we had to scale back. And if we got all of the places, then I think you'd have a lot better picture uh, because you get a lot more of the outliers, a lot more of the variability. We could only capture really the Pacific uh, and part of the Pacific at like that. So I think that's absolutely right. I don't know the answer to it. The question that also might be in this sort of threshold category, but the, the last slide you talked about more of the dynamics. And I'm, I'm sorry? More of the dynamics, so yeah. the temporal yeah. kind of aspect. And then you were talking a little bit about the different threats and the human threats. And so I think more about human threats and uh, human choices and activities. So from my perspective, I would think there's a there's an important spatial aspect to this problem as well, and I was wondering if, from more of an ecology perspective, and when you're starting to think about modeling the future, if you're also thinking about sort of spatial lag. Well, that's yes, exactly right. That what we could do with a single trip across the Pacific is get a snapshot. Yeah. Right? So what we did was we, we used the the space for time uh, substitution, right? Saying so we can't do it over time. So we're going to assume that everything works the same and just make a giant data table. But if you can go back, then every place is its own place. So the changes that happen here may not be the same as the changes that happen here, but you can you can get you get them. So explicitly spatial. Yes, yes, yeah, space uh, and time. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, yes. I, 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 that's what I want to do. Yes. <laughs> Like more species, is it mostly just like sclerotinian? Um, or are you guys doing like bacopore and other stuff that could be some of that missing discrepancy? Well, I, well, I don't talk about octocorals. <laughs> they get in the way. So we're leaving the Florida processing for now because the octocorals uh, look like corals, look like sclerotinians. Mm -hmm. And so 
there's going to have to be additional processing, uh, uh, um, intelligent processing worked into it, not just based on the spectrum, but on location of the, uh, including location on the reef and things like that. So you can try to tease out, is this a Gorgonian or is it a, a Sclerotinian? That's a, it's, it's, it's at this point, it's tough to do. I want to try my question again. I, <laughs> so I, I guess I was, I'm thinking of a case and my question would be, the, you're trying to predict the status and changes of coral at a particular, say, spatial area in the future. You're thinking about um, how stressors would impact that area. And I'm asking, would the status of, say, the coral in sort of the next spatial unit over or the human activity in the next spatial unit over impact the you know if you're trying to predict the status of the coral going on you know in the future is that yeah. something that you're so yeah she is she has special auto correlation yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 i just didn't see it in the last equation it was all just yeah. temporal i I, I realized i was i was talking too much and i was okay. going through too fast but, <laughs> but but yes it should be included explicitly absolutely and of course the farther away you are the less of an impact you know right the the, the, the spatial yeah. unit the farther the spatial unit is away from the one you're considering Yes, that should be included in, but what scales? So how far away do, 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 do human, the human settlements, let's say, how, yeah. how far? Is it, is it just a linear gradient or is there some step function or something? Unknown. And, and there's a, is there an ecological pathway to that sort of spatial autocorrelation as well? Well, yeah, I mean, so, so, so yes. Uh, Give me a PhD student, and, and yeah, okay. so so so, <laughs> no, 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 so, so but 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 yes, there there, there are um, so so ecologists do do study spatial spatial ecology is a thing. For the world. Okay, it's a field. So Thanks. yeah, we don't have all. <laughs> all right. Eric, there is often talk about the Great Barrier Reef, mm -hmm. and. Uh, also studies in the Red Sea mm -hmm. from off Eilat. And I remember correctly, they say in Eilat, the changes are not as dramatic as mm -hmm. in the Great Barrier Reef. But at the same time, I think the temperature gradient is higher in the Red Sea than around the Great Barrier Reef. Yes. So what protects the, uh, is, is it the assemblage of corals that is more well, uh, resistant yeah. or what, what is it actually that, that leaves these uh, corals around Eilat? That's probably a, a question better for the coral biologists. But that being said, I'll, I'll gladly try to put my foot in it. And, and that is, so the, the, the Red Sea and up by Eilat are, are, it's a marginal area. It's, it's, it's an extreme <laughs> latitude, temperature, precipitation, these things. So um, through natural selection, you're going to select for hardy uh, individuals. So it's, <laughs> the, it's the assemblage that has already been pre-selected through a lengthy pro process, yeah. that lengthy time. That's what, I, that's, that's what I tend to think. The Great Barrier Reef is at the confluence of a lot of ocean currents. And so it does it differently that uh, maybe at one given time for one given event, a lot of the corals may not be, may not be suited to those conditions, but there's always uh, a supply of, of new recruits. So back in 2016 and 2017, there were two years of severe bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef and scientists pulling their hair, oh my, this is the end of the Great Barrier Reef. Last year, they resurveyed and said, oh, a lot of it grew back. So the question is, what grew back? Is it is it adapted, or is it the same stuff as before? That's a, that's a question. But does that actually mean that even in the accelerated time scale at which we are putting pressure on, that the system can actually reconfigure, regenerate a combination thereof, and that it's not quite as bleak as we are sometimes thinking? It is? That's my opinion. I I, I do agree with that with, with that, um, and I personally think that. When you talk about a healthy coral reef, it's the ability to do that. That to, to regenerate it's a forest, if a forest can grow new trees, 
then you know it's probably a healthy forest, more or less. I don't you know. There's obviously successional stages, more complicated than that. And reefs aren't forests, corals aren't trees. Reefs exist even without the corals, so that's another complicating factor. I have a, I know that we're out of time. This isn't a question. It's this is probably like a three beer discussion point that I would just want to toss out here. So what I think about a lot in thinking about these near shore zones that are so dependent on light, 20,000 years ago, sea level was 400 or 140 meters lower than it is now. And so in only 20,000 years, these reefs either didn't exist or have moved very quickly upslope as sea level has come back up. And of course, sea level sort of stopped accelerating nearly so much around 6,000 years ago. And yep. So they've probably only been where they are now for a few millennia. Yeah. Right, and so when we talk about evolutionary timescales, we need to remember that these things have been on the move yeah. for just twenty thousand years. Right. Well, yeah. So modern reefs have been there for about six, seven thousand years. Right. That's it. Um, so as I said, Kaneohe was an old Sandian. The Great Barrier Reef were hills mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. facing the ocean. Yeah. So um, the, the, the you're you're absolutely right, and and. But but corals, the the, the order Scarabtinia, have been around three hundred million years. That's right. That's right. They've faced near extinctions and grown back, and and uh, um, so evolved, mm -hmm. and, and they continue to evolve. Uh, and so I think you're absolutely right. But is that just spatial movement, or what were the environmental conditions? I mean, because I, I couldn't envision that spatially you move fast. The question is, what were the water temperature salinities, whatever, nutrient conditions? Because the upwelling regime was changed too. Yeah. If you go 120 yeah. meters deep, yeah, that's actually an interesting, it's a really interesting question to look at the yeah. dynamics of the, of the, the peak of the glaciation. So we know that the, the planet was a lot but, older. But additionally to this, the adaptation with the with the physical environment um, may have so so surface circulation vicariance. So the ocean surface currents had different intensities, and so so this is Charlie Ver Varon, right, talking about vicariant uh, evolution, vicarious evolution, where 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 repeated hybridization and speciation because the sea level is doing this, and the corals are separated and connected, and, and so. And so this all plays into it. And uh, you're absolutely right. Geologists don't think there's a problem with reefs because <laughs> they've been around. It's, it's the marine biologists who think that there's a big problem. And, and it's interesting to bring that together. I mean, I remember when I went to Columbia La Bond and Rick Fairbanks was drilling old corals at, at Barbados to, to calibrate time scales and things yeah. like that. Yeah. There was some discussion about, first of all, it, it was just a, a great archive, um, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they tried to figure out what what might it have meant in terms of the composition and things like that. But that, you know, they, they were too focused on on just the time scale, so they didn't really go deep into right. that. But that that's actually a good discussion to yeah. have between these the people who are looking at it from different perspectives. I, I I would add a very one small thing. I apologize. Back in the eighties, before scuba diving became popularly available and coral reef science was a much smaller community, there was actually debate whether they should be called coral reefs at all. This is before the decline, the global decline of reefs, that people said you know, they're, they're algal reefs. They're mostly algae and sand and coral is not a large component of them. Back 40 years ago, 50 years ago, there was a debate that Debate got forgotten in the 90s. So it all goes, it's all part of it is, is how. And then so in the in the spirit of justice and inclusion, you know, and the sponges are always forgotten. <laughs> sponges are always forgotten. <laughs> the sponges, you're absolutely right. We have a we, I had an intern who went on to get his master's studying sponges in the Red Sea at Kaust. And he comes back to BIOS as a TA, he came back to last year's TA, and said, Michael, you're giving a talk on sponges. And and they're absolutely right. He said, but Bermuda is boring for sponges. There's not very much. But, yeah. Can we squeeze in one more question? Happy to. Okay, it's a good one from Mary Donovan. She said, you've mentioned scale a few times and suggested that scale mismatches may relate to why you aren't finding patterns. 
What's your proposal for a way forward in, in reconciling scale with your data sets? It's reconciling scale with your data. Your data sets. My data set. So the idea behind Coral, the Coral mission, is to get data at scale. That was the whole point of it. Um, so we, we got, I, I downloaded all the data I could from diving, from NOAA, from Ames, wherever I could get it. And that was the data that, that showed, oh, there's a, there's a problem here. That was, the, that was the impetus to do the Coral mission, because from the, from the air, from space, you can see the whole reef. You can see a kilometer of reef at once. That was the whole point to scale up. And the results show that, yeah, we can get a better understanding, still not all the way. If that, I don't know if that makes sense, Mary. I hope it makes sense. It's just down the road, maybe. Oh. <laughs> Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you very much. Again.